The message for today is that the Father loves you, and the sermon title is Abba, which uh, I decided to go ahead and put that on the screen in the Greek because it's one of the absolute few Greek words that you can actually look at in Greek and recognize in English. And uh, so, let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your love for us, and uh, Lord, as we examine important lessons from Scripture today about you and who you are and what that means for us. We ask that you would bless us and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. James and Justin walked along the beach. They were on a father and son adventure. As father and his son Justin, Justin was three by the way, went along the beach they, they were just having a day of it. They had packed a lunch. They were going to have a picnic. But one of the first things they did is they chased the waves. Have you ever chased the waves out? It's like a game of tag, except you never get tagged when it's your turn. Because next thing you know, you're chasing the waves. And with absolutely no warning, they turn and chase you. And it's time to run away from them. And so James and Justin had chased the waves out and now they turned and were running back. And just at the last moment when little Justin was about to get taken over by the wave, dad picked him up and ran with him and they got away from the waves and they continued to walk on the beach and they were looking and for some shells. They found some really neat shells that day. And, and uh, the Pacific Northwest on the beach where they were, uh, lots of driftwood washes up. They were looking for some small and unique pieces of driftwood. Just quite a journey. And they sat down to uh, enjoy the scenery and uh, have their picnic. And as they were eating, it just been such a great day. Dad and, and son, father and son, three-year-old boy, Justin looks up and asked his daddy a question it was this question i don't know that daddies are ever really ready for a question like this daddy what is god like well james was thinking how am i going to answer this what am i going to say and so it was time for another bite of the sandwich which he prayed and chewed very slowly because he knew the next few words really mattered lord what do i say my son has asked daddy what is god like and as he finished that bite of the sandwich and swallowed it down and prepared himself to answer he answered justin god is like a father daddy what is god like god is like a father this would make wonderful sense to little justin that day because he had been experiencing the love of a father that day the companionship the protection the care all of that was there but you know for some of us the metaphor of god being like a father is not a good one for us because of our experience. Some of us had experience with a father that was abusive or cruel or mean or completely absent. And so we struggle with this metaphor. Now, I've got a wonderful father. And I talk to him on the phone several times a week, sometimes several times a day. And I love my dad. And he was a great father, but he wasn't a perfect father. He'd be the first one to tell you that. I'm not a perfect father. This, this imagery of God being like a father is, is marred a little bit for everyone because none of our dads have been perfect, right? And so when we think of God being like a father, what does that do for us and how can we relate to it, especially if uh, for some of us whose uh, earthly experience with a father has, has left a lot to be desired you know, with abusive fathers and that kind of thing. Well, when uh, Jesus was asked by the disciples if, uh, if he would teach them how to pray, 
he definitely encouraged the use of the term father. And so James was right in answering Justin that God is like a father. Jesus began the example prayer with our who? Father, which art in heaven. My friends, the father loves you. But as we think of this metaphor for father, what is a father supposed to be like? Because that, that's important for us uh, with various different backgrounds, some of us having not experienced a father, some having had abusive fathers, some having wonderful fathers, but yet not perfect. How, how do we view this? Well, here's some of the things that biblically should come to mind when you think of a father. A father is a protector, right? A father should be loving. A father should be kind. A father should be consistent. A father should be a provider. A father should be a teacher. And this was one that was more popular in past generations, but is, is yet still there today. A father should be firm. The Bible takes, talks about fathers, the, the fathers that love their children will discipline them, you see. And in Revelation, it says, those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And so these these elements, what is what is missing from that is things like cruel and mean and exacting and vindictive. And th those things are, are not there in the biblical picture of a father. So if those have been modeled for you, you've got to work through this metaphor as to as a heavenly father, God is the ideal father. And he's what a father should be. The father loves you. There are three New Testament passages. Three New Testament passages that use a special word with father. We'll read each of them now. It says in Mark 15, 26, and he said, Abba, father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. This is Jesus praying there in the garden of Gethsemane. If this cup, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. He says, Abba, Father. Now, this special enduring term with Father, it would certainly make sense that Jesus would pray it, right? Because of the close relationship with Father and Son. But it goes beyond in the Bible to show that it's a term for, for you and for me. That's right. In fact, Romans 8.15, you have received the spirit of adoption. And so, ad adopted by the Father, if you were, where we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6, and because you are sons, we are sons and daughters of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, what? Abba, Father. Now, Abba, what, what is that? Again, I, I put it up in the Greek because it's one of the few words in Greek you can recognize in English. And uh, this Syriac or our Chalde word is found three times in the New Testament. We just read those three references. And in each case, it is followed by the Greek equivalent, which is translated father. It is a term expressing warm affection and filial confidence. It has no perfect equivalent in our language. Now, I'm not one to argue with the experts, but I think it does have a great equivalent in our language. I've experienced it as a father, and that is where I think each of my kids uh, uh, have done it, but, but Jackson's about the only one that'll still do it sometimes, and he's growing out of it, where he'll give me a hug and he'll say, my daddy. Not just daddy, but the my daddy. I think that's a pretty close, close equivalent, but I may not have it just right. The Father loves you. Turn me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at the parable for today in our sermon in Luke chapter 15. And in Luke 15, we see here starting in verse 11. Luke 15, 11. And he said a certain man had two sons. How many sons did he have? Two. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, both sons then, his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, 
journeyed into a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal. The word prodigal means wasteful living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he had spent all his money. All of a sudden, his friends and the girls were gone. As you read on through the story, you discover that just to survive, he had went to work for a man in that part of the country that had him go feed pigs. And then in verse, I believe it's verse 16, it's worth pointing out, I think. And he would, have, would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. Now, for a Jewish person, the worst job you could imagine would be take care of the pigs. But notice his low point when he realized that the only thing he could eat was what the pigs were eating. And notice what's even lower than that. People have told me it's a good substitute for chocolate, but it's not a substitute Oh, it's true. If you look here by pods, a Bible with a marginal reference, mine has a number one byte. I look up here, it says, or carob. The prodigal son realized he had absolutely hit bottom. It was time to go home when he was having to eat carob. Just an interesting thought. Those of you that haven't had that experience, just be, be thankful. It can be made well, I'm sure, with enough sugar, but... Um, but don't, don't try to tell anybody it's a real substitute for chocolate. It's, it's, it's not. Just, uh, just one of those little things. It's just right there. It says the pods. It's, it's carob. So just for interesting. So he came to himself in verse 17, which is the way the, the, the rabbinical way, the way a, a Jewish rabbi would exp- describe repentance, came to himself. Because obviously, if, when, when you repent, you've, <laughs> you're finally thinking right. Okay? And so he's going to go home. And he says, you know, my, my father's servants, they have more food than they, they need. They, uh, they, they have it made, really. And so I'll go home. And instead of being a son, I'll be a servant. And I won't be feeding pigs and, and eating carob anymore. And so he makes the decision to go back to his father. Now we pick up the story here in verse 20. I closed my Bible, so let me catch back up with you here. We're in Luke 15, now verse 20. It says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, I would propose that for today's lesson, we'll learn more about the father than the son in this parable. You see, there are several ways to approach the parable of the prodigal son, and all of them worthwhile. We certainly have all been a bit prodigal in our lives at times. And if not, then we've certainly been like the older brother in the parable. And so, but what we're going to learn today in the parable is about the father. Now, the first thing is the father saw him when he was a long way off. This is an attentive father that has missed his son and is watching for him. And it's important that if his son ever does return, that he sees him first. Do you know why? In Bible times, they typically would live in a village and their fields would be out and about. They needed the protection of living in the village. And so where where their house was would not even necessarily be adjacent to the fields they farmed. They might be two or three miles outside of town and they would walk out to work and walk back. And so why is it that the father needs to see the son first? Because the way that the son has treated the father, give me, you know, I would give me my inheritance. In other words, I'd rather you be dead and just have what I need. I'm going to leave you and be done with you anyway. And so he would be treated with disdain by anybody in the community that saw him. And to the father, he absolutely had to get to him first. And so he's watching. He's attentive. Again, we see a picture of our Heavenly Father in this parable. You read on, and it says here in verse uh, 20 then, that he saw him, he, he, he had compassion on him, and ran and, and fell on his neck and kissed him. See, when we've been wayward, when we've messed up, when we make mistakes, when we have a life full of those things, the Heavenly Father looks at us with compassion. 
And at the first sign, the first hint that we want to be right with him, return to him, want his help, the father is portrayed as running. Now, in Bible times, it was considered rather uncouth for an elderly person to run. You would certainly not have an elderly person competing in a half marathon in Bible times. That just, that, this, that didn't gel, right? Okay. But he runs. He doesn't care what people think. He wants to get to his son and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, now the last account we had of where the son was was in the pig pen. Eating the pig. It's not, it doesn't say, and he got a fresh shower and got on nice clothes and then went home. But his dad runs and he's, he's, he's taking him in his embrace and he's, he's kissing him. He's thankful to see his son. Now, we read the next verse. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. How does the father respond? He doesn't actually. I mean, he's definitely doing something in response to what was said, but verbally he doesn't respond to the son as it's accounted here. Rather, he says in verse 22, the father said to his servants. So the son saying, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father turns to the ser servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. And sandals on his feet. Oh, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. What are those things talking about there? Well, typically, you wouldn't find that the servants would have the best robe or even shoes. Get a robe, get shoes. The ring there would likely not have been something for adornment, but would have been uh, a signet ring, which contain the seal of the family if you will important documents would be uh, sealed with a drop of wax and the signet ring would be put on and pressed into it that'd be like uh, the son coming home after having gone and been in dark places and finally coming home to dad and dad pulling him aside and saying uh, son here's the here's the black master card there's no limit on it you get whatever you need except more more important than that Okay, and then it says here, kill the fatted calf. Now the fatted calf, the, the, the idea was they would keep up a special calf that they would feed special food so that it would be fatter than all the ones in the field. And it was there in the event there came any need to celebrate. Or, or perhaps another feast like a, um, a morning feast. But nonetheless, generally speaking, the fatted calf would be there just in case something really special happened. So everyone was happy but the calf. Kill the fatted calf. That would be, that would be to feed about 100 people, right? Uh, it, it's a cow. Kill the, kill the cow, we're going to eat. And so... Major celebration, okay? And then he says here, verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive. Is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. For the purpose of our study today, we'll stop there. Though the parable continues and brings in the elder brother and, and his bitterness and issues. But we're studying about the Father today. And so, from the day he left home, his father would not sleep well. By day he looks down the path, and by night he looks out his window. He prays every night and suffers for the absence of his son. You say, well, they didn't word it that, exactly that way in the parable. No, I took a little bit of liberty. But for a son, a father to, when the son finally, was, was this 60 days, 90 days? Was it a year? Was it two years? We're not told. But when the son finally comes staggering home, the father immediately notices him on the horizon. He's been praying, he's been watching, he's been looking. What an accident. And what this brings home to us is the father loves you. And don't forget, one of the other aspects of the Father we see here is freedom of choice. The Father in the parable could have denied the request. 
Well, if you want to go do that, go do that. I'm not giving you your money, though. You can wait till I croak if you want it. That's the way it is. But he didn't. The Father loves you. This book does a great job of going through the parables. Uh, it covers most of the parables in the New Testament, and the parables as object lessons. That's why the name of the book is Christ Object Lessons. And it says this. In his restless youth, the prodigal looked upon his father as stern and severe. How different his conception of him now. So those who are deceived by Satan look upon God as hard and exacting. Uh, let's pause right there. Have you ever in your life felt or come across others that have felt that they feel Jesus is kind and loving, but the Father's hard and exacting? That's a common viewpoint that people have. Continues on. They regard him as watching to denounce and condemn. That, that God's just up there really down on you and has you under his thumb and, and you know, just, just waiting just waiting for you to mess up. No. But he whose eyes have been opened by the love of Christ will behold God, will behold the Father as full of compassion. He does not appear as a tyrannical, relentless being, but as a father longing to embrace his repentant son. Do you think that this prodigal, I know it's about the father, but let's ask a question about the prodigal son. Do you think that from the time he gathered his possessions and left home to the time he then returns and end up, ends up at a celebration feast with the fatted calf, do you think that somewhere in that trajectory his view of the Father has changed? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps one of the reasons this is so important for us to spend time on today is there may be those of us today who need our view of the Father to change. The Father loves you. There's no difference in the way that the Father loves and that Jesus loves. There's no difference in that the idea that, that the Father is one who condemns, but Jesus is one who accepts. No, the Father is the same. Speaking of the character of the Father, Jesus said in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. Jesus came to show us what God is like. The Father loves you. In this most popular Bible verse, perhaps the most popular, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you ever stopped to really break down what this is saying about the Father? Say, so, oh, well, Jesus loves me and He came and died for me. That is true. Yet, this verse is specifically referring to the love of the Father. It says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We know it's referring to the Father because of the relationship to the Son. God the Father so loved the world. Now the world, we know, we believe that had it only been one, Jesus would have come. And so it is entirely appropriate, in fact I believe important, for you to internalize and think of this in a personal way. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son let's rephrase it even this way for the father so loved me the reason jesus came is because the father loves you jesus loves you too i'm not diminishing that but 
God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. There was a lady that came to a minister seeking prayer, asking him to pray for her. He said, sure, I'll be glad to pray for you. But as they knelt down to pray, she said, can you just pray to Jesus <coughs> and not to the Father? Well, some people think it's, it's, it's wrong to pray to Jesus because Jesus' model prayer was our Father which art in heaven. And, and while that, that is true, you actually find examples in Scripture where people prayed to Jesus. So you go look it up for yourself. That's a good Sabbath afternoon activity for you. Nothing wrong praying to Jesus. But this lady had had an abusive father and she couldn't imagine the love of a father and that's why she made that request she had a wrong view a deficient view of father the father loves you but what is your picture of god what is your picture of the father do we like the prodigal need to go through a transformation in our view of the love of the Father. He's not an angry judge. He's a loving Father. He loves you beyond measure.